Hi, and welcome to Unprecedented Journey. I'm your host, Jeff Oppenheim, and I thank you for joining us again today. Well, I don't know about you, but as I carry forth on my quest to remain productive during our quarantine, was supposed to be Quarenta Giorni, 40 days, and seemingly never ending, I'm using it continually as a time to remain productive and address things that I always say I never have enough time for. Well, the one thing I do have now is time, lots of it. One of those things that I just never seem to have enough time for is reading. And oftentimes I'll read for a project, a documentary that I'm working on, then all of my reading material is gonna be related to that. Or sometimes in preparation for an interview, if I'm doing something especially in politics, I'm gonna do a deep dive in terms of what I should be preparing for to ask a really pertinent question. But for me, just cause, that never seemed to happen. I never seemed to have enough time. Well, <laughs> until now. So what I started doing was going back on the bookshelf and pulling down books that are classics. The Stranger. Haven't read it for a long time. Also started going on my shelf and pulling down books that have been sitting there probably since I read them the first time and obviously I kept them on the shelf because I wanted to read them at least a second time. Well, guess what? Now is the perfect time to pull those books down and reread. Water for Elephants, a really great book and a fairly good movie. I also, of course, love to stay current in especially now all the politics and all the perhaps rhetoric that's going on right now and take it back to some early sources that I referenced. Really important read, The Federalist Papers. Probably haven't read it since school. Good time to pick it up now and reread it. And of course, just even sometimes small chapbooks of poets and poetry. Just because it's that perfect meditation, a quiet moment, you could read one or two of them and just mull them over just before you go to bed. Something to think about beyond the rhetoric and the noise. But of course, how do you find those new poets? How do you find those new authors? How do you find those new little gems that you can share with friends next time you're chatting with them? Beyond the New York Times bestseller list, which tends to be the sensational reads, and let's face it, driven probably by the bigger publishers pushing forth the books they want you to believe are the bestsellers, where do we find those gems, the new diaspora of authors, writers, poets, playwrights, etc.? Well, I decided to go back to my roots. I don't know if you know this, but I used to run a literary organization for 10 years, which I founded in memory of my father, a writer too. So I invited a writer friend of mine, a fairly new friend, Christina Chu. She just published her second book. It's her first novel. Her first one was a short story collection, award-winning, sold out, did really great. And her new book is great fun, great reading. And after reading it, I said, well, you know what? Let me invite her on to Unprecedented Journey to share her work, her thoughts, her reading, writing tips with all of you. She is not only a writer. I should also say she, well, she engages herself as a writer on literary circuits and literary salons, but she also organizes them too to bring her fellow writers forward. So I thought she'd be a great co-curator for this episode. She also works with a nonprofit organization that's all focused on literature again, and that is called Prison Rights. That's W-R-I-T-E-S. And they go into the prisons and teach writing and encouraging incarcerated individuals to write their story. And believe you me, I'm sure they've got quite a number of stories to tell. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to my guest today, Christina Chu, author, curator of the series that's going to come forth. Christina. Hi. Thank Hi. you for joining me. Now, you said you're going to bring some new writers to us, new to us at least. Tell us who they are and who we're going to meet and tell us a little bit about their work. So we're going to hear from Octavia Ahebi. Octavia is a poet. She is incredible and when you hear her read in person, it's a, she's a knockout. Um, Sergio Troncoso, he wrote a collection of stories that are sort of connected and uh, very interesting. and. He's actually gotten a fair amount of um, publicity, but um, yeah, I, I think that book is really noteworthy, especially now. Uh, Matt Johnson uh, is one of my favorites because uh, he, I just love 
I love his work, but um, in particular, uh, I have this book, Pym, and uh, I think it's just a masterpiece. Well, wait a second, you, you left off one of my favorite authors, Christina Chu. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> They'll be talking about craft sustainability and how they manage for the long haul. In terms of craft, craft is important to me. Even though I'm not, as I said, on that academic craft track, I know that I have to always um, improve um, my own um, writing style. And that's why I love um, residencies and seminars and things like that. I had the pleasure of meeting Christina at the uh, uh, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, you know, working with those uh, those lovely folks up there. So I'm so I'm always looking for opportunities to um, to improve, to 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 be inspired by, to see how my own writing can be impacted. Right, even as an old lady like me, I tell my kids I'm always looking um, to refine and to do better. So that's very important for me to participate in those types of activities. Um, and I'm very fortunate that um, there are so many just locally. And of course, I, I love the opportunity to, to go away when I can just focus just on that. So in the first couple of years, I had to go to work uh, at about 10 o'clock in the morning. So I'd wake up at six and I'd work from about six to nine, or at least try to work from about six to nine. And then um, I would go into work uh, and, uh, you know, that would be it for the day. And then other times I would come home and I would work at night and then print everything out and then edit during the day. And it's just changed. I mean, I, I can't write at night anymore. Uh, when I had, my kids were small, I couldn't write in the morning. So I've learned to just kind of steal hours here and there uh, to try and, and work. But, you know, it never gets easier. What I have learned is the importance of staying in your project, uh, particularly if you're writing long fiction, staying in it. A, a bunch of years ago, I got a job at a university and there was a professor there who was about 40 years uh, older than I was. And just like I was, he'd been hired at the job with two books and he had never published another book um, while he was there. And, you know, when I talked with him about it and his regrets about that, he said you know, the biggest problem was that all school year he would just, you know, be focused on being a teacher. And then at the end of the school year, that's when he would decide to write. So he would just jump in at that point in June. And for the first month, he just wasn't in it and he was pushing it and oftentimes pushing it in the wrong direction because he wasn't feeling it. And he was just kind of moving in the dark. And then he said he started to get a feel for the project, usually towards the end of July. And then he would have about three good weeks of writing after having all this time where he'd been going off wild goose chases and then boom, it would stop and it'd be time to go back to school. And he'd do this for years. And every time he did it, the work suffered. And so he had written multiple other books, but they had never been up to the level of the first ones because he was doing this hot and cold method. And so that told me I didn't need to do that. And instead I needed to try and stay in the project. Even if I wasn't writing on that project, for sometimes months, uh, I would put aside time every day, whether that was while I was doing the dishes or, or you know, folding clothes, to think about the project, to think about the world of the project, not in conclusive ways, but to start asking questions that I could set myself up later to answer on the page. And once I did that, um, and once I accepted how slow this process could be, it started to, to move forward as well. And this act of faith that it would grow eventually bore fruit. I believe in writing on multiple, uh, working on multiple projects at the same time. That has always worked for me. And so I am sometimes working on very short stories uh, or essays, something that 15, 20 pages or so. And at the same time that I'm working on a memoir or at the same time that I'm working on a novel, which is a much longer uh, marathon, so to speak. And, and that's, that kind of work uh, has allowed me to always stay busy because I, one of the things I've learned about myself is that the more I have to do, the more I actually get done. So, so for me, my day is most productive in the morning when I am starting new work, work that I'd never 
something from a first draft. I typically start very early in the morning, let's say around seven or eight in the morning, and I write at, until I get exhausted, three or four hours, typically. And, and then I take a break for either lunch or, or a late breakfast. And then in the afternoon, I might look over what I just did, but typically I leave it alone and I edit something I've already worked on, something I did maybe a week ago or a month ago or a longer project. And that, that begins the process in the, in the afternoon. So I, I typically work on things I've already done that I'm, um, you know, that, that, that I'm working on. And I think my rationale that has worked for me is, is when I'm editing, I need a separation between me and my work to be able to be brutal um, on, on my own work, to look at my work as an, with an editor's hat and to look at it from a reader that has not written that. So it, it's sort of a, a, almost like a lie you tell yourself uh, to be able to be a, a very good editor of your own work. But I need that separation. So I, I, I never edit anything that I just wrote because I don't have that separation. You know, when you write a first draft, you think, oh, this is the best thing since sliced cheese, of course, um, but it's not. And so you need that separation. I typically put another work or two or three works in between the work I actually edit in the afternoon. So it, it may be something I wrote two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And, and I don't have that, that emotional connection to, to the work. And that allows me to be brutal and, and difficult and, and ask questions about every line, every paragraph, every chapter. That I, that I am editing in the afternoon. And I think uh, that's one of the things I learned as a, you know, as a writer as I got older, uh, how to become a better editor of your own work. Uh, I think the other, uh, so that, that sort of just to run you through my day. So I typically write new stuff in the morning. I edit old, older things in the afternoon. And then in, after I'm exhausted from editing, I might work on contracts or work on events or, or booking events uh, right before dinner, right after dinner. Uh, the things that were not necessarily creative, but it's still the business of writing. And then at night I read. I read until I have to go to sleep. Um, three, four, five hours. Uh, you know, if you want to be a, a good writer, you have to be a voracious targeted reader. And what I mean by that is that you should be reading for a purpose. You should be reading because you're trying to understand maybe the narrative flow of Tolkien, or you're trying to understand uh, the dialogue um, and word choice of Zora Neale Hurston, or you're trying to uh, appreciate, you know, the moral quality, the moral questions that are subtly introduced by somebody like Faulkner into his, his work. You know, it's reading for a purpose, reading to dissect the craft of some other great writer and, and understand that craft and, and, and take it apart and, and see what you can use for your own. So, so I, I, I am reading because I enjoy and I love many of these writers and other writers, but I'm also reading for a purpose to try to learn something new that I don't know. And so that's my typical day. Um, you know, and, and, you know, to give you a sense of, of, um, you know, of my process. And, and it, I find that when I do that and I keep that pace day after day, I very rarely get writer's block um, because the reading will inspire new ideas. The reading will also help the new writing that I do in the morning. Uh, the editing makes me sharper when I start writing something new in the morning as well. So they, these different aspects of my daily life influence each other all the time. And, and, you know, I even work sometimes on Saturdays, but I try to do something different Saturday and Sunday, something physical, something, get out there and, and, and work out, simply to open my mind and get out of the rut of, of simply sitting 
uh, on, uh, you know, and working all the time or, or reading. Because I, I, I find that things like bicycling and, and, and jogging and walking, I walk often five miles a day or maybe three, three and a half to four miles a day. Um, open my mind and I actually am thinking about problems and issues that I had in my work as I am exercising. But it's a, a sort of a liberation to be using your body and, and taking your mind off things. And in a way that taking your mind off things inspires you and gives you a solution to a problem that you couldn't solve by simply sitting in front of the computer. So, so I think you have to be very self-aware as a writer about your own perspective and your own biases. So if you're sitting too much in, a, in front of a computer and, and not really doing any research in the field, you've got to do that. You've got to work toward you know, that medium of doing more things out there to understand uh, and appreciate and improve your own writing. If, on the other hand, you're not doing enough sitting on your ass time, working, pounding out those words, you got to do more of that. If you're staying within your community too, too much and not understanding what other people um, are, are facing and, and the, the struggles that they're facing, you got to get out there and get into the community and talk to people and listen to them carefully, simply to understand motivations of what you're trying to write perhaps on the page at home. So, so I think uh, this self-awareness as a writer of your own biases, of your own uh, perspective, the limitations of your own perspective and how to overcome those limitations, how to keep inspiring your own curiosity, all of this will help your writing. It'll also help you to be a better thinker about what you should write in the first place. So, so that's sort of a... a uh, a snippet into my writing process and how I think. Well, thank you to all of our writers and thank you to Christina Chu, who's also a writer, of course, but she's my co-curator for our first ever unprecedented journey, Literary Salon. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you'll tune back in because I'm going to be asking the writers some more questions and tips they can give us must have resources for the would-be writer in us. So I hope you'll join me for these upcoming episodes. And also, remember, if you like these authors, if you like what you heard today, pick up their books. Not online, not at a mega retailer, but at your local bookstore. It's a way of helping them out. It's a way of helping the writers out. And also, you'll notice I put their websites up. I also will do that in the description column here on the YouTube channel. Be sure to like, comment, share, and hey, subscribe to the channel. That would be great. I'll see you on the next episode. I'm Jeff Oppenheim for Unprecedented Journey. Thanks for joining.